Hi, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I am your host, Olivia Fierro, news anchor by early morning here in Phoenix, Arizona, reader by late night and busy afternoons, and uh, trying to host a show that pushes back on the concept that my nine-year-old is constantly saying, which is books are boring or books are for librarians. He does not know how cool librarians are, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna correct that over the summer. I'm joined by super producer and avid reader Margaret Stewart. We will have a moment with Margaret after our interview. But now it is time to meet our guest, and we're really excited because there is uh, something special uh, that's connecting us with this author. So Catherine Center is a New York Times bestselling author, and she has been called so many nice little titles, including Queen of the Comfort Read. And she is helping you to read for joy and giving you all the feels. I finished Things You Save in a Fire just last night. So Catherine, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And as you well know, Olivia's Book Club, which I, it's weird to say my name in the third person, so I don't <laughs> intend to do that or don't do that in real life away from the microphone. But we gave a stack of books that were straight off of my own TBR and had our members vote. And they had some really great selections and they voted for things you save in a fire so thank you very much and uh i'm happy they did because i absolutely loved it oh i'm so glad to hear that that's awesome thank you so talk to me about i know i feel like we're we went a little out of order because this is not your most recent book but we were looking for paperbacks and and different um books that had been recommended and margaret had very wholeheartedly recommended this particular one. So that's how it, it snuck its way into my stack as it all often does. So tell me first about your most recent, which I believe is just coming out in paperback this July. Yeah, it's um, my most recent one came out last summer during COVID, during all the craziness. <laughs> and it's called What You Wish For. And it's kind of a story about a school librarian, in fact, a very cool, cool. hip. <laughs> School librarian with pink bangs and she's at this kind of amazing school on Galveston Island in Texas and it's kind of like everybody's sort of great dream of what a really awesome school could be and she suddenly winds up getting this terrible new principal who comes to the school and tries to mess everything up you know oh. like they have like a beautiful butterfly mural painted on the wall in their school and he wants to like paint it gray, you know, and he's all worried about safety and he wants to put bars on the windows and do all these <laughs> things. So she winds up, her name's Sam, trying to save the school, but in saving the school, she also kind of has to save this new principal and the whole community kind of has to come together and figure out how to help him be a better version of himself. So yeah, that's kind of what it is. It's, um, you know, it's a story about learning how to be happy even when life is hard. And that really was perfect for for you to be talking about and digesting during COVID, right? Yeah, it was a good it was a good book for that crazy time. Yeah, I think in in reading what, what so many people have had to say about your work over the years, it's sort of like giving you that hug or giving you this you know feeling of connection and making people just feel good and feel the emotions that they need. So is that a reflection of kind of how you are in your interpersonal relationships, or is this what you're you sit down trying to give your readers a gift of some kind of human connection. Yes, absolutely. That is um, always what I'm setting out to do. You know, I am not the most hopeful, um, automatically positive person in the world. Like I myself am always looking to get inspired and looking to kind of believe in the best of humanity and looking for human connection. Like, I think of books as a certain kind of nourishment. Like when you talk about your son saying that, you know, books are boring, I think some books are boring, <laughs> right? Honestly. And uh, what I'm really interested in is finding the book at the right time. That's the right book for you. Because when that actually happens, when you give yourself permission to read the books that you want to read, the books that you're excited to read, the books that like connect somehow with something in your psyche, that something you're kind of struggling with or interested in or excited about, when you find a book like that at the right time, it's like magic, right? And it's so nourishing, like nothing else on the planet. And so I am always trying to write the books that would be nourishing for me. Like if I had a Saturday with nothing to do and a fuzzy blanket and a cup of tea, like what story would I want to read? 
And I try to follow that compass. So yeah, I do write comfort reads I, I, on purpose because I myself am in need of comfort. So it's like a gift that I can give to other people, but also to my own inner reader. If that makes sense. I love that. And I, I've often thought, and we've talked about how sometimes it feels like books find you. They find you when it has a message that you need in your own life or, or, or giving you a different lens to look at what's going on in your own life or your own relationships or what changes maybe you need to make. And so it's, it is, it is, it's that relationship, not only just between author and reader, but I mean, really the words on the page and they can mean different things to you depending on what space you're in. Because, you know, if you're just through a bitter breakup, maybe you don't want a romance novel or, you know, the vice versa, so many things, or, or we're responding to what we just read and we want to be lifted up after a very sad one. So uh, for our book club, I think in particular, people were looking for a little, you know, hug on the heart and to be uplifted. We had been through uh, the four winds with Kristen Hannah, which is, of course, a beautiful book, but is always uh, an emotional, um, you know, a, a lot of emotion pouring out. So we needed we needed some warmth from you and you're delivering that and especially in talking to you today. Yeah, you know, I'm always trying to find for me, it's I, I am actually um, like in real life, like a very funny person. And my husband is a very funny person. And we spend, I don't know, 80% of our relationship bantering with each other. Like we just sit around trying to crack each other up. Like that's kind of what we do. And it's actually one of our primary coping mechanisms, yeah. you know, for life. I mean, we've been together since I was 22. We have a couple of teenagers now. And, um, you know, we've done, a, I think, a really good job of being married. <laughs> but um, part of the way that we do that is that we cope really well with hardship. It's not that we got a happily ever after where nothing hard ever happened again, right? Nobody gets that in life. Life is always going to bring struggles and hardships and grief and difficulties. But for us, it's all about how do we bounce back, right? How do we get back up? How do we make it funny, if at all possible, right? And so the books that I write are this combination of like funny and sad, or at least that's what I'll, always what I'm shooting for, right? It's, it's characters who have to struggle with genuine hard things, mm -hmm. right? And who have to um, face challenges that are that they're not sure they can deal with or conquer. And at the same time, the way that they cope with all that hardship is by cracking a lot of jokes, right? And kind of being goofy. And I'm always trying to find that balance really between the darkness and the light. Cause I want my books to have both. I want them to be sort of grounded in real human experience and hardship. But I want them, I always want the characters in the stories to be moving towards something better, yes. you know? And I want us to have that feeling as we're going through the story that like, we're going to be better for this somehow, you know, we're going to, we're going to come out of it wiser and more compassionate and stronger in some essential way. And part of the reason I write stories like that is because I really want to believe that that's true about human life, you know, <laughs> that when we have to go through hard things, that we can come out of them better you know, and uh, that our struggles really can lead us to our strengths. That's what I want to believe. I can tend to be very pessimistic and not think that's true. And so part of the reason I write the stories is kind of to convince myself. I want to see it happen over and over. And so that's, yeah, that's what I do. I write stories that are funny and sad for that reason. Thank you, because we we need to hear that. And my husband makes fun of me because he says I'm a fatalist. And so I see everything going in the worst direction at all times. And sure. so it's you you really need to be reminded of how you can be better for whatever obstacle uh, you're going through. And certainly humor and bonding with, with people who will share in that humor is a great path forward. And, and that's very much what I got out of the book was just a, was the journey. So let's talk a little bit about things you save in the fire. And I, we won't want to give any spoilers away. We'll, I'm going to save that, of course, for uh, the book club when everybody has finished. But um, where did Cassie come from for you? And I understand your husband had a little bit of influence in all of this. <laughs> Yeah, my husband is a volunteer firefighter. He's an EMT paramedic volunteer firefighter, and he's also a middle school teacher. So he's a he does many things. But the whole time I've known him, he's been volunteering for the fire service in some capacity or another. He was working as a paid paramedic when we first met in 94. Um, and he loves the fire service. I mean, he so hooks into that heroism of being the helpers, right? Of, of, of being the people when everything is 
you know, going to hell, being the people who are like walking in to go and help and solve it. So he's been doing that forever. And uh, he has a million hilarious stories. And um, I've heard them all. But when it was time to write this book, I actually asked him if he would come and sit down with me and tell me the stories again so that I could listen to them in a different way. Mm -hmm. Because before I was always just kind of listening for the punchlines because they're most of them are hilarious. Some of them are heartbreaking. A lot of them are very gross and scatological with like lots of body fluids. In fact, some of the stories he told me that I went ahead and put into the book, my editor was like, no, you got to take that out. That's too gross. Like we can't dramatize people like that. But he's got a million great stories and I had listened to them before for fun. But this time I got him to tell them to me again and I listened to them and tried to imagine that I was there. You know, I tried to listen to it in a whole different sort of three-dimensional way where I was trying to imagine that it was happening to me, that I was doing those things. And that's a totally different way of listening and actually makes for some great date nights. I mean, we had a lot of fun going back through his history. That is so um, cool. It's you're kind of learning, learning your, your person all over again by seeing them through the writer eyes. Yeah, I got to see him in a whole different way, um, which was which was great. So that's been really fun. I also went around and interviewed um, a bunch of uh, firefighters at various firehouses around town, and that was intimidating but awesome. They were hilarious and also very warm, and they just like invited me right in and let me sit at their kitchen tables. And I just took notebooks and notebooks worth of notes. I mean, I was getting like hand cramps. I was writing so much because I wanted to just get it all in there. I was a little bit intimidated to write about a firefighter because I've been around it long enough to know that that's a very specific world. You know, that's a very specific culture with people who have a specific set of values and ways of coping with life. And uh, I wanted to get it right. I felt a lot of pressure to get it right. Mm -hmm. So I really did a ton of research before I started writing. And, um, and then, you know, at a certain point, you just let the research go. You know, you've done it. You've done everything you can do. And then you set all those notebooks aside and you just write the story and see where it takes you. Well, and I, I love the the references to just the identity that draws people there. And of course, everybody, I mean, they get to to be crude and fun and kind of play by their own rules in the space of, of a firehouse and having visited many of them in the course of my career too. And, you know, you go for lunch and whatever it's, you, you get that. That's very, that's very real. And it felt very authentic, but also the identity of who are we? We are the helpers. We are the good guys and the expectation that that will permeate all of their lives. Yeah. I mean, Cassie, you know, I think the question Cassie's having to ask herself in this story is who does she want to be? Right. And, and that's a question we all have to ask ourselves, like in this situation, confronted with everything that's happening. Who do you want to be in this moment? Do you want to be somebody who makes things better or somebody who makes things worse? And um, there's a moment when um, something bad has happened to Cassie and she thinks it's one of the guys in her firehouse and she goes in and she's like yelling at them. Right. And she's giving them this sort of lecture and trying to you know, trying to call their attention to what's not okay about what's happening. And there's a moment when she's just like, you know, if I can't believe in you guys, who can I believe in, right? We're supposed to be the heroes. We're supposed to be the helpers. And, you know, I think that's true. We all get to choose who we're going to be in those situations. And for Cassie, she's got a lot that she has to deal with. And she's got a lot of choices that this whole situation she finds herself in force her to make about deciding how she's going to move forward. And I'm very proud of her because I think she did a good job. I think she moved forward in, in exactly the ways I was rooting for. Oh, she definitely did. Well, I think you were in control of that. But uh, I just, <laughs> you tell me, are you a writer who sits down and OK, so you, you know your premise and you know who, who our heroine is and who we're rooting for and who's on the journey here. Um, but you don't know where it's going to go. Or are you somebody who has got it mapped out start to finish? I'm a terrible mapper hmm. and, and I'm a bad outliner. Um, I always try to outline and I'm just bad at it. I get halfway through and get distracted. Actually trying to think about the big picture is hard for me because as soon as I start thinking about the big picture, I immediately um, start hearing them talking and get lost in, in the scenes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, when you're writing a story, you sort of have to be able to hold the big picture in your mind at the same time that you've got all the little details in your mind. It's like you have to do both at the same time. And it's very hard for me to do that. I always want to go into the details. I hear them, they start talking. I hear them talking. And then I just want to 
listen. <laughs> and I, um, plotting is always trickier for me. I really think about it a lot. I read about plots a lot. I study them. I try to figure out what you need to do. I think of it like a roller coaster. Like there's a shape to a story and you have to, as the writer, you kind of have to decide what that shape is going to be. And the hope is, you know, like a kiddie roller coaster is going to give you a very different visceral experience than like a loop-de-loop, -loop, right? Those are just different because of the structure. So I think a lot about how to structure it to give people the right, the kind of emotional experience I want them to have. And that is hard for me. And I really, I kind of overthink that a lot. What I don't overthink, what's super easy for me as a writer, the thing that kind of got me into the game and, and got me hooked and kept me here forever is dialogue, is people talking to each other and is um, little scenes, you know, scenes just kind of, appear in my head and then I just write them down. But I really do feel like when a story is really cooking, when it's really got like a big fire in its belly and it's just going, um, it's really almost more like taking dictation wow. than anything that I'm consciously doing, if that makes sense. That's amazing. So, yeah. I mean, if you get all the pieces in there correctly, if you choose all the right elements to the story and you kind of let them marinate in the right way, then it just, it's like the Velveteen Rabbit or something. It just kind of comes to life in this magical way. There's a point when you're pushing it forward. And then if you're lucky and the magic happens, there's a moment when everything shifts and the story comes to life. And instead of pushing it, you're being pulled by it as a writer. Wow. So oh. I am kind of consciously making it happen, but it's also, it's a little bit like when you're dreaming, honestly, like when you dream, you're technically writing that dream, right? With your with your head, but it doesn't feel like you're writing it. It feels like it's just happening. And that's kind of how story writing is when it's really cooking. Wow, I think that's like that whole concept. I mean, that just speaks to what a gift it is. And obviously you have done all of the work to, to um, hone and polish this craft, but it, it's a gift. And that's why I think when, as readers, we all sort of have a dream of maybe we have a book inside us. And then you hear that and you think, no, that magic would never happen for me. How? how? How would that happen? Well, I never think it's going to happen. I mean, truly every book as I'm starting every new book, I'm like, okay, what did I do last time? <laughs> like, I don't know. What did I do? Like, how did I find that magic? So there's always, it's always a little nerve wracking to get started. Cause you're like, oh man, I hope it's going to come together the way it needs to come together for it to find that magic. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to force that to happen. It just has to happen. You just kind of have to stay with it until you land on the thing that's going to light everything up from the inside. I spoke with Sally Hepworth and she was saying that no one is more obsessed with listening to writers talk about their process than other writers. And the irony <laughs> being these are very successful writers who obviously have their own thing that works, but they're always sure that there's something better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Although I think for me, I've really worked in my adult writing life. Like when you're when you're young and you're just starting out and you're just learning, you're kind of copying other people and you're thinking about what is everyone else doing and you're kind of almost using this external compass mm -hmm. for what you're trying to do. But I think as you get older, there's a kind of um, centeredness that comes where you kind of, you sort of know what you like, you know, and you know what you're looking for in a story. And, and, and at a certain point, you've lived with yourself for so long. I mean, I know, for example, that I am not a multitasker. Like, I am a one thing at a time person. And so when I'm writing, like, when I really have a deadline, I actually leave town. Oh. Because um, if my kids are around, my cute kids or my fun husband or my, like, needy dog, if any of those people are around, I can't concentrate you know I think of writing a story almost like you have to walk out to the end of a long dock and get in a rowboat and untie yourself from the dock and like row out into the ocean of your imagination and um if your kids are on the shore it's really hard to give yourself permission to untie yourself from yes. the dock right like my kids are there. I gotta keep an eye on those guys so I just leave town so that really the rule is unless someone is in the hospital or on fire, nobody's supposed to call me when I'm out of town writing. And I'll go for like four or five days and just do a huge amount of work. Oh, that's so great. Do you always go to the same place or are you are you open to based upon what theme you're writing or? Well, obviously I'm open to any luxury hotel that would Duh. like to be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, my mom actually has a little beach. I don't want to call it a house. It's like a shack, a little beach shack in Galveston, um, and, uh, she's had it forever and ever. And, uh, I just kind of go down there and, and, you know, it's sunny and it's cheery and I open up all the windows and the breeze blows through and I just, 
you know, I go down there, I get up in the morning, I make a pot of coffee, I sit down to start writing, and the next thing I know, it's dark outside. Wow. That is so, so awesome to do. You're awesome. truly doing what you're meant to be doing and, and, and what you love, which is just so great. And that the, your enthusiasm for it is so infectious, not only just from reading it, but from talking to you, certainly. Um, you're obviously a people person. So what had you missed the most maybe about this pandemic time period? And I imagine that you used to probably like to get together with either your readers or with other writers who you respect or, you know, know some somehow. Um, I, I'm, I'm an introvert extrovert hybrid. So I actually love being around people, but then when it's over, I have to go like take a three hour nap, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I really, really missed visiting book clubs and traveling around and doing authory things. Like I love doing that stuff. I like speaking at luncheons, you know, I love going to book festivals, all that obviously was shut down last year. Um, but I also was really fine too, in a weird way. I mean, other than the massive anxiety of like, oh my gosh, how do I keep everyone I know alive? Mm -hmm. Right. That's obviously the burden going on there. Um, you know, I sort of, it was kind of nice to have an excuse not to go anywhere. And, uh, I just sort of felt like, you know, I've sort of trained all my life for this moment. Like all I have to do is like run the bubble bath and get in there with a romance <laughs> novel. I'll be good. I'll see you guys next year. Like it's fun. So it was. It was hard in a lot of ways. The worry was very hard mm -hmm. um, for me. And, um, but, but the, but the actual fact of staying in the house was kind of okay. <laughs> well, that is a very good thing. And I bet you, if you can work from home productively too, um, all the better. So let me, let me just rewind a little bit because, um, things you save in a fire, I want you to give a description for us, for those who are listening, who have not yet read this particular book. Who is Cassie and, and what's her journey? Okay, um, Cassie is um, a firefighter in Texas at the start. She's um, she's a really good firefighter, kind of an up and coming firefighter. And what happens to her at the beginning of the story is that her mom, who she's not very close to, who she's kind of estranged from, um, gets sick. And Cassie winds up having to leave her job that she's very happy in and move across the country um, to a little fictional town outside of Boston called uh, called Lillian, where um, she has to join a firehouse that's all men, and they've never had a girl before, and they're not very excited to have her. Um, and so basically, it's a story about her trying to prove herself in this new firehouse, right? Trying to convince all these guys who do not want her there that she deserves to be there and that they should be glad to have her. Um, but it also winds up being a story of um, Cassie having to figure out her relationship with her mom. So that's, you know, a tricky part of her life. And then, uh, and then there's one other element going on in the story, which is that on her very first day in the firehouse, um, there's a rookie who's joining on the same day. And the rookie, uh, the first time she ever lays eyes on him, um, he's just been hosed by the guys <laughs> in, the, in the firehouse. Uh, with the with the fire hose and he comes in just dripping wet and just looking totally gorgeous and she's kind of like gobsmacked by the sight of him like she has this crazy like love at first sight thing and she thinks of herself as a tough guy she is not a person who gets into relationships she's pretty closed off and so now she's forced to work with this totally sweethearted delicious rookie and that you know, being around her mom who she thought she didn't like and being around this super sweet sexy rookie who is totally irresistible. Both of those things push on her and force her to figure out who she is and force her to kind of change her life a little bit. She's forced into a state of change. It, it, it must happen. She's forced into um, the act of forgiveness in a lot of different ways. And she has to shake up that hard shell that she has built up that's very protective and has been very successful for her because um, she's like almost a superhero but uh, unflappable at least until these moments i actually highlighted the heck out of that first interaction with the two of them <laughs> because it was so i just it was it was so well done um I kind of like you, you took your breath away exactly what she was feeling. So I will just read just the tiniest little bit. And, and I know that you know it, but it's kind of fun to hear it sometimes when you've stepped away from it. Um, it. She feels like she's having a heart attack, basically. So it was comforting in a way to know that I was standing in a whole room of guys who could save my life if need be. But then the rookie met my eyes and smiled at me. And I had to admit to myself that it wasn't a coronary. 
It was worse. It was the rookie himself. I was having a reaction to the rookie, a romantic reaction, the dumb kind. It just, it's just, that put me like so in, in who she is, in the moment, in the, all the, oh, that, that, it was so great. So the, the, these first meetings were just beyond. Well, and one of my favorite things about this story is the love story, because I'm a huge fan of love stories. I'm, um, I'm a believer in the nourishing and healing potential of love of all kinds, you know, between humans, but especially, you know, romantic love. It's like one of my favorite things to read about. And so, you know, when I'm talking about trying to balance the darkness and the light, there's a lot of darkness in Cassie's life. But for me, the rookie is definitely part of her light because he just coaxes her out of that shell by being just like, irresistible and adorable and baking chocolate chip cookies. Um, there's a scene I love in the story when they go to a, a medical call and um, the call's over and they're all leaving and she turns around and the rookie's like walking out with like a puppy in a basket because <laughs> the old lady who lived there just took a shine to him and gave him a puppy. Like that's the rookie and you know, he's irresistible and he just kind of melts her. And I love watching that transformation with Cassie. I love seeing how she goes from being closed off and hard and shut down to just not being willing to say no to all that stuff anymore. Just like giving herself permission to be vulnerable, to take chances, to define courage for herself, right? To love people. And, and the same goes for her mom too. You know, as her mom, that re those two relationships kind of press on each other and she winds up having to figure out forgiveness and some stuff with her mom but also, you know, just falling madly in love with the rookie. And that's, to me, that's really fun. It was so much fun. Okay, so <laughs> I was going through a little bit of your website, and there were so many funny things that just stood out to me. So I want to just touch on um, Duran Duran and the role of the great Duran Duran in um, forming you as the writer that we now know you to be. <laughs> yes, I got my start in the sixth grade writing fan fiction about Duran Duran. <laughs> Before fan fiction even existed, like it wasn't even a thing in the mid eighties, but you know, I was very awkward in the sixth grade and very self like crushingly self-conscious and miserable, you know, and <laughs> um, I was lucky because I had two best friends who were also awkward and also miserable. And we were all in love with Duran Duran. And we somehow got this idea that we should write novels about meeting the band members and, uh, and we should cast ourselves as the main characters. Well, in the of novel. course. So we did. And I wrote a story, a very fictional story of um, meeting Duran Duran and then all five of them, you know, falling in love with me. Mm -hmm. And then that was the story I had Who to decide. Who did you choose? Which one to marry? Simon, I... John, uh, Nick, um, wait, oh, I'm close. Wait, two Johns, right? No, Roger? You know yourself. Um, yeah, I chose Simon. Ah, oh, Simon LeBlanc. Um, you know, though there were many good options, but John there was Taylor. a little bit of negotiating going on amongst the girls for who would get who. But yeah, Simon was my my number one. Maybe that just stuck out to me because um, one of my first concerts was Duran Duran, and I stood uh, just weeping when Save a Prayer was playing. I mean, just weeping. Like I couldn't handle all the emotion. Like how could someone have so much emotion in their very small body? It was just a lot. Powerful stuff. <laughs> it's a very powerful stuff. Um, I, I know know that you have a newsletter, and it seems to be, I just, there's something, you're spreading joy everywhere, and you're giving people little gifts of you like things, and you like to share those things. So how are you using this newsletter, and, and what types of, of passions of yours that have nothing to do with your books are you highlighting? You know, I, my newsletter has turned out to be one of my very favorite things that I get to do. I think about it all the time, actually. I am a person who falls in love with things. I just get excited about stuff. I get obsessed with things, you know, and, and with good things, you know, with things that I want to talk about and want to share and want to get other people to enjoy too. And so uh, the newsletter kind of came out of that, you know, it's, um, it's called three good things. And every time I send it out, it's like four times a year. It's like, um, you know, here's a great podcast that I heard, right? Here's a great novel that I read. Here's a great nonfiction read that I totally devoured, right? Here's a great song that I can't stop listening to on repeat. And so um, I just put them out there for people to enjoy. I mean, my whole idea is that it's just joy for your inbox, you know, that it shows up and it's full of flowers and you just find all these great things and hopefully they make you as happy 
as they make me. I do not find it naturally easy to be happy. Happiness is something I'm always thinking about and working on and trying to kind of gather into my life, you know, and I feel like other people need help with that too. I feel like I'm not the only person. Mm -mm. It's so easy to think about all the problems you have to solve all the time, especially when you're a grown up. And so, yeah, just spreading a little bit of joy is such a, um, such an inspiring kind of elevating thing for me to get to do. I feel very grateful that that newsletter has become a big part of my life. It's really fun to put it together. And it's really fun to hear back from people. It's just a delight. Yeah, and you are not wrong that people have to make a concerted effort to, to be happy. And so, yes, any smile, any surprise, any any interaction with a person who is really sharing a, a joyful energy in that moment is it makes a huge difference. I just feel like the the, the trickle down and, and, and power around the world is, is incredible with, with some of these small acts. As I wrap up, I don't want to keep you too long, but I do like to hear from novelists and in creative minds like yours i feel you obviously you can't be a writer before without being a reader and so you have a passion for reading what do you remember being the first book or books that you really fell in love with that clicked and you knew that this was a space for you oh my gosh that's such a great question so many first of all i mean you know i could just pick a school year and i could go through it but but i'm just randomly going to pick sixth grade mm -hmm. um reading um the secret garden by francis hodgson uh -huh. burnett um it ju i just got lost in that book i had like a three-dimensional experience with that book where i felt like i was there you know in england and i identified with her so much and i and actually what cracks me up about reading that story because it was so special to me for so long and when my when my daughter got old enough for me to read it to her she was probably like I don't know, seven or something um, I was so excited to read it to her, and I remembered it as a love story. I remembered it as a love story between the girl and her and the boy who lives in the house, mm -hmm. right? And um, it is not a love story. There is like there is never a moment when those two kids declare their love or get together or kiss or anything. But I'm reading this to my daughter. I'm flipping through, and I'm like, oh my god, when are they going to get together? And then I realized they never get together. Like this. <laughs> It's like, oh, it's it's when they get into the garden, they get past that gate, and that's when the kissing starts. Just wait, just wait. Nope, doesn't. <laughs> I actually, oddly enough, I shared that book with my son as well, and he was not loving it, but we did get <laughs> we did get through it, and uh, and finally, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let you read the big Nates and the Dogmans and the everything else that you like, and just so that you'll stop rejecting all books. <laughs> Well, thank you so very much for sharing um, this story. I'm so happy that we're sharing with our book club and just everything else that uh, you are bringing. I mean, it is it is so wonderful, and I'm really going to encourage everybody to sign up for your newsletter and check out your website and all your social media, and I know you're very active on Instagram. And when can we expect your next new work out? Oh, I just turned it in. Yay, congratulations. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very... Um, it's very delicious. I wanted to write a really fun story because it was during the pandemic. I just wanted somewhere fun to go in my head. Um, and uh, it will come out summer of 2022. So it takes about a year in production. So it's a little, little while before it hits the world, but it's very delicious. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you so much, um, Catherine. It has just been wonderful to see you. Let me make sure I can see you again, please. Oh, there you go. And um, oh, thank you so much. Oh, it's such a treat to be here. I'm utterly delighted. I could just live here. <laughs> we got to put that backdrop to good use all the time. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Center, thank you so much. And uh, talking about things you save in a fire, and we'll be looking for all of her other books. Um, so many books, and she's helping us read for joy, and we appreciate it. Well, I want Catherine Center to be my new best friend. My list is growing long. It's yes. long like a TBR stack. Mm -hmm. um, so in our moment with Margaret, a, let's talk about how charming and adorable she was. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, also her painting. Just super she, talented in a thousand ways. Yes. If you weren't able to see the video of this podcast, she has this beautiful wall. Mm -hmm. Talked about it in the beginning. And it is so cute. And it just brought a lot of life to her 
Zoom background. It really did. I mean, yeah. you could got you got a great sense of her personality oh, and yeah. who she is the second you looked up. <laughs> well, and it's funny because with her, I find her covers to be so vibrant, mm -hmm. and it's very much a a discussion of who she is as a person. Like she's a very vibrant person. She talks about trying to find happiness mm -hmm. all the time for herself. But I think just with her covers and her color and the vibrancy she brings. Yeah, she is Lovely. super fun. So I am all over that newsletter. You better believe yes. it. So we were talking about things you save in a fire because that was our book club selection um, voted on by our book club members. And if you haven't joined a book club yet and you would like to, in addition to listening to this podcast, you can go to the Olivia's Book Club Facebook group. But... It's about Cassie, who is a female firefighter, and she's like the best firefighter. But that inspired you to start thinking about some books that involve uh, women or people who are working in industries where, you know, they're not seeing themselves everywhere. Yeah. These three, three different genres, I found that these are less female dominated in general. Mm -hmm. The first, of course, I'm a thriller reader, mm -hmm. The Burning Girls by C.J. Tudor, which is a an English or a British thriller, which love that genre. Mm -hmm. The main character is a female vicar. And you wouldn't necessarily think of people in the priesthood mm -hmm. or in clergy at all being female, especially like I was grown up Catholic. Mm -hmm. I am Catholic. So women were not predominant right. at all within the church in that, in that same way. So leading a church. So, and her name, she goes by Jack, because her name's Jacqueline. I believe she goes by Jack. And it threw me off because they kept using uh, female pronouns. Oh, but you were assuming Jack said. But, uh, so I was very confused and said, like, single mom. You were thinking like, Austin Powers, that's a man, baby. Yeah, and but it's funny because I've never really thought about vicars being women mm -hmm. in the Church of England. Yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about it. So I found that to be really interesting. Slight side note. I had no idea what a vicar was when I first read Bridget Jones' diary. Oh, really? Remember that was like, it was a part of the costume party thing. It was like, a, it was like a hookers and vicars or something like that. That's so funny. And so I had to look it up. I <laughs> actually, at a young age, realized what a vicar is watching. Oh, I love this show. Keeping Up Appearances. It's a British sitcom. It is so good, but there is a vicar that would appear in it and um the main character her last name is bucket okay but she pronounces it bouquet <laughs> so everyone's like hey mrs bucket and she's like it's bouquet so anyway that's a great british sitcom All if right. you're into we'll it we'll have to add that to the notes because i know you won't remember but okay the burning girls mm -hmm. cj tudor that's a great one and then my rom-com i recently read this and ironically about podcast mm -hmm. it starts as a guy reporter for a public radio station wanting to do hard hitting journalism mm -hmm. and a woman producer for a show that's doing okay, but not so riveting. They start working together to make their own show that ends up becoming a podcast that they are fighting against each other, but essentially they're working together, but, you know, they don't like each other. Is it sexual tension? There isn't there always mm -hmm. in a rom-com? Well, it's rom -com. Yeah. If, if there's not, then <laughs> it's maybe not the right. genre. So what's interesting is in this, there's a lot of the male reporter is getting all of the accolades and the attention from the boss. And this female producer is trying to fight for her way up. Like, well, this seems, doesn't make any- realistic. Producers, man, <laughs> we're just trying, we're just working. <laughs> like over here. We're doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> not to say reporters are not, <laughs> but in this particular sense, she was doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Okay, so that's called what? The X Talk by X -talk. Rachel Lynn Solomon. Love it. So that was a good one. And then my last one, historical fiction, Madame Tussaud, mm -hmm. Tussaud. I say Tussaud because I am who I am. I but, say Tussaud. Um, it's by Michelle Morin, Moran maybe. And this was actually a book I received from a package from Changing Hands mm -hmm. last summer during the quarantine. It was given to me as a birthday gift. And historical fiction is not typically my genre, but I read it and I was so intrigued because she was brought into this world of wax figures by a man, her her uncle, essentially. And 
it's not something that you would think women were doing. And he was, they were making wax figures, which apparently were being used to tell the news of the French Revolution and the, the things that were happening really? around France. Yeah. So people would go there in the idea of seeing these busts or these full, you know, wax figures telling the news of what's going on at the palace. Huh. And it was really interesting, but it, it's all male dominated. And then here comes this woman, Madame Tussaud. So it's and apparently the, she's good at it. Uh, apparently so. And it, you know, historical fiction, it talks about in the back how they, they reach their conclusions mm -hmm. about this and that. But it was, to me, it was very interesting that I had no idea. That's surprising. And it's yeah. always fun when you enjoy a book like that and it's not necessarily what you would have pulled off yeah. the shelf or reserved weeks ahead of time. Right. right? And then, yeah. And then it's funny because that's when... With historical fiction, very much like Chris and Hannah or any other historical fiction writer, if you really enjoy a book like that, you're going, oh, well, she, I really liked that. What other mm -hmm. books? So there's an Egyptian one about Cleopatra that I am all for. I'm going to get into that one next. Too. <laughs> all right. This yes. was our moment with Margaret and our really fun conversation with Catherine Center, who, um, gosh, she was just, just delightful. So these writers are just so interesting. Yes and full of life and lots of ideas and dreaming up probably better things than I could write, write with all, with a lot of coffee and focus. And that's why they're the writers, And right? that's why we're the readers. Yep. So keep on reading, people. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.